The coming of Jesus was the announcement of the kingdom breaking in. And there's more to come in the future, but we also get the taste of it in the here and now. I love in the wedding of Cana when Jesus says, don't you know that my hour has not yet come? And what does his mother do? She doesn't take no for an answer. She pulls on it. And that's the attitude we're to have. We're saying, let's take some of this that's to come and let's taste of it in the here and now. In the words of George Eldon Ladd, one of my favorite scholars on the kingdom of God, he says that humanity in the person of Jesus was experiencing the presence of God's future. The presence of God's future. In Jesus' life, we see the reality of the rule and reign of God, the kingdom of God coming in power, his will to crush the works of Satan, according to 1 John 3, 8. It was being manifest and actualized as he not only proclaimed the good news of the kingdom, but he demonstrated the good news through healing of sick bodies, driving out demons, cleansing of lepers, and raising the dead to life. He demonstrated the kingdom by things like freeing the oppressed and extending radical forgiveness. The doing is just as important as the telling. Another example is in the book of Romans, chapter 15, verse 19, the apostle Paul writes, by the power of signs and wonders, through the power of the Spirit of God, so from Jerusalem all the way around to Lyricum, I have fully proclaimed the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see multiple instances by the apostle Paul where he ties the gospel to power, where he ties the gospel to the manifestation of signs and wonders. And in the Greek, this this word... uh, Fully proclaim that this passage, fully proclaim the gospel, means that as Paul traveled, these regions were filled up with the gospel. They were filled up not just by the words that Paul preached, but by the actions that came alongside those words to validate the kingdom. It's very interesting that Paul's understanding of the preaching of the gospel is directly connected to the demonstration of power through signs and wonders. And in 1 Thessalonians 1.5 is another example. Paul says, because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit and deep conviction. In Matthew 10, 7 and 8, it says, as you go, proclaim this message, the kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons freely you have received, freely give. Jesus tells us this is what we should do to proclaim the kingdom, and this is still what we do. This is still what we do. The gospel was receiving and giving away. Hey guys, we'll be right back to the message. I just wanted to let you know that Voice of the Apostles, one of our flagship conferences, is happening soon. We have amazing speakers, including Bill Johnson, Heidi Baker, Dr. Randy Clark, and many others. We'd love to see you there in person, but if you can't make it, you can also attend online. Click the link to learn more. Now back to the message. How many of you have, have studied the healing revival of the 40s and 50s? People, men like A.A. Allen, Oral Roberts, Jack Coe. Uh, someone who is not quite as known as some others, but was a very powerful minister in his own right, Raymond T. Ritchie, has a quote that, uh, that I really love. He says, healing is the dinner bell for salvation. Healing is the dinner bell for salvation. And so the reason we're to to have such an attitude of pursuit and forcefulness regarding the miraculous is because it demonstrates the, not only the reality of the reign of God, but it demonstrates the goodness of God that draws men under repentance. Evangelism is, becomes tremendously easier when you do it through power. It becomes tremendously easier through doing it with power. And I could, I've got story after story. I'm gonna, I think I should share some stories about this a few years ago and and see it doesn't you guys know this already you've been hearing this throughout this whole week it's not just because you have one of these in your hand it's for every single believer that's part of the beauty of the kingdom of God it's inside every one of us and it's expanding and of the increase of and of the increase of his government there will be no end it's for every single believer every one of us is living in the reality of the nearness of the kingdom of God. And we all get to do this. And it doesn't happen. uh, We don't have to be on on the buzz of coming off of a great conference in order for it to happen. And things like this are great, and you guys are going to leave here and be off the buzz of this empowered event, and that's wonderful. But it also happens in the highs and the lows of everyday life. And so I wasn't off of the buzz of a power encounter. I was simply out of Dunkin' Donuts 
few years ago. Anybody loved, who, let's do a poll, Dunkin' Donuts versus Starbucks in here. Dunkin', Starbucks, yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna lose the meeting if I keep going. So I was at a Dunkin' Donuts a few years ago, and uh, I don't remember what I ordered, but I, I had struck up a little bit of a conversation with another man that was in line with me. And as I'm leaving, I turned and I said uh, something like, have, have a great day, God loves you. And he said, no, he doesn't. He actually said, that is a lot of bull, is what he told me. And yesterday, I spoke of the fact that words of knowledge can come through spontaneous speech, and I turned and I looked and I said, no, it's not. He does love you and he cares about you and he cares about Anna Marie. Who is that? <laughs> this is in the middle of the Dunkin' Donuts. And so tears come into his eyes. And now these, these, these stories that you hear when, when we're telling these stories, it, it seems like, you know, it's these Superman moments, but you feel like Clark Kent in the moment. <laughs> Nearly every time when these things happen, you're scared to death. It's like you're arguing with someone and it shoots out of your mouth and you experience it like the matrix in slow motion. You want to stuff it all back in. But tears come into his eyes. And he said, Anna Marie's my daughter. I said, that's right. She has an injury to her ankle from soccer, doesn't she? He said, yeah, she, she's had that. She's been in a lot of pain. I said, God's healing right now. He's also touching your back. And I walked over, placed my hand on his back. He starts weeping. His back's getting hot. God's touching his back, healing his back. And he says, who are you? And I said, I'm a Christian. I'm a follower of Jesus. The way that he's touching your daughter, the way he's touching your back right now, he wants to touch your heart in the same way. Do you want to give your life to him? He said, yes, I do. Gives his life to Jesus, opens the door through this encounter to several of the employees. See, Dunkin' Donuts, they're sort of like subways where they're tiny. They're not big settings. So everyone is watching this happening. So what everyone is seeing is the kingdom of God breaking into their midst. And what happens as a result of this is people say, we want to know this same Jesus. What we're seeing happen to this guy, we want some of that in our own lives. And out of the eight or so employees there, six of them gave their lives to Jesus. And this is what happens when you demonstrate the kingdom. This is what happens when the kingdom draws near. It draws people to accept the king when they witness the goodness of the reality of his kingdom. And this is just something that happened in a Dunkin' Donuts. Uh, 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 Year, several years ago in Georgia, where I'm from, I'm from uh, deep south Georgia, by the way. You'd never know it um, because I don't really have any accent, but the rest of my family could be on Duck Dynasty. <laughs> so I'm in Georgia, and uh, I just got through eating at um, a pizza restaurant. You know, so, you know, so many of my testimonies, for some reason, they involve food in some way. <laughs> And so I, was, I just got through reading at one of my favorite pizza restaurants, uh, downtown Milledgeville, Georgia, where I'm from. And um, I'm standing there. Uh, actually, I wasn't standing. I was sitting on a little bench and uh, talking with a few friends of mine who are there visiting me. And we see this large group of college students from the near, nearby uh, military college walking by us. And one of them is on crutches. It's obviously he's in a lot of pain. He's wincing. We start conversing with him and find out he has uh, a broken knee and torn ACL. And so as we're talking with him, we just say, can we pray for you? And he says, well, it won't do any good. And we said, well, can, would, you, would you just let us pray anyway? And he said, are you, it was funny, he said, are you a Catholic or Protestant? And I said, why does that matter? And he said, well, I don't know if you'd be willing to pray for a Catholic. And it was a little bit of a funny exchange there. And he said, yeah, we're willing. And God's willing to heal you. And so we could tell he's completely put off and he doesn't believe. He has no stock in any of this. And we just said, would you just let us welcome the presence of the Holy Spirit to come and heal? And he said, sure. We start praying for him. We're praying for him outside this restaurant. Now all of his friends are standing around. It's a group of about 10 or 11 of them. And his leg, I'm praying there along with one of my, one of my good friends named Matt. His leg starts doing this. And we're watching this. And his eyes get like this. And he looks up at us. And he goes, what's happening? What's happening? And we say, this is Jesus. He's healing your leg right now. And his leg gets done vibrating. All the pain leaves. He tested out. It's completely healed. And now in the middle of this moment, he looks and he starts evangelizing. In the middle of the moment, saying to people, 
Jesus is healing my leg right now. Jesus, just heal me. Come and get prayer. Come and get prayer. And he's shouting this. And see, we're the, we're the ones who are supposed to be doing this. And this person that we're praying for, he takes our job. He starts evangelizing everyone. Look at what Jesus is doing. It's the nearness of the kingdom. It compels people to give their lives to the king. I'll tell you another story. I, I have rarely told this publicly. I believe I've only told it publicly on two occasions, but I feel like, I feel like uh, for whatever reason, like I should share it. Yeah. <laughs> it's another story from my time when I was in Georgia. See, I'm just telling, I'm telling you things. Not, this isn't, I'm not telling you this to build myself up. I'm telling you these things to show you the reality of what happens when you just give yourself to the expansion of the kingdom of God and the fact that it draws people to the Lord. And so I was in a moment of, um, I used to go on very long prayer walks. I don't really do this anymore. Uh, but I would go on prayer walks for uh, an hour, two hours at a time. And sometimes it would lead to things like a treasure hunt. And sometimes it would lead to nothing. I'm just walking and being with the Lord. And I was walking. And uh, I live in a very rural area, surrounded by a lot of woods. And... Um, I didn't realize that it was getting very late, it was getting dark, and before I knew it, my prayer walk led to me being lost. And so uh, I had sort of a back route that I would take walking through the woods to make my way to my house. And um, I, I had found myself in a different part of the woods, I didn't really know where I was at. And so I am lost. I have my phone, but there's no signal. And I'm walking through the woods, and I see a little bit of a fire, and I think, uh, well, at first I didn't know it was a fire. You see a little bit of light, and if it's, if it's from a great distance, you don't know what the source of light is. So I see this light in the middle of the woods. I get a little bit closer, a little bit closer, a little bit closer, and I see it's a campfire. I see a group of people encircled around the fire. To make a long story short, it was a group of witches. And so I stumbled upon them. There's a dead cat in the middle of the fire, and they're chanting. And now imagine... You know, in the middle of the night, pitch black, you stumble upon this in the woods. I was terrified. I'm standing there watching this, and I'm, I'm, I'm pinching myself, wondering, is this even real? And someone asked me, how did you know there were witches? One time when I told this, and I said, well, they were dressed in all black with their hoods up, chanting with a sacrificed animal in the middle of a fire pit. <laughs> so I'm watching this, and I'm scared to death. And I'm, the, honestly, the only thing on my mind, I was not thinking, how can I lead them to Jesus? I was thinking, I'm, I've got to get out of here. And I tried to back up slowly. And, you know, if you've ever seen a scary movie, I step on a stick and it snaps. So they turn around and they see me and the leader looks at me and she yells, what are you doing here? And I'm frozen. I don't have anything to say in response. And she yells it again, what are you doing here? Frozen. She says it one more time, and all of them are looking at me, and I'm thinking, that, you know, this is it. I'm, I'm dead. <laughs> and for whatever reason, just in a moment of the Holy Spirit inspiring courage, I spoke up, and I said, I'm here to tell you, I'm, I'm here because God sent me here to tell you that he loves you. Amen. And now the leader of, the, of their little group is of the, I don't know, 10 or so girls, they're all, they're all female. The one who's yelling at me where I was frozen, now she's frozen. And then she starts absolutely wailing. And all of the other girls turn and bolt. They run off into the, into the woods. I have no idea where they went. Never saw them after that. And now this girl, she's wailing and crying and weeping. And I had a moment where I sort of waited this out when she regains a little bit more of her composure. And she's crying so hard, she's actually shaking. And uh, I find out her story that her mother is actually a Pentecostal believer for several years, and, and she tells me her testimony how she started off becoming interested in uh, the occult, and she, she starts off as a Wiccan, and she gets a little bit more into the New Age side of things, and, and, and uh, very interested in the supernatural, but from, from, the, uh, from, the, from the wrong perspective. And um, she's sharing this with me, that her mother is a Pentecostal believer, and, she, and, and um, she would tell her every day over the last uh, one and a half or two years, I'm praying for you, I'm praying for you, sweetie, that you would know Jesus. 
I'm praying for you that you would know Jesus. And she would tell her mother again and again about how much she hated Jesus, that she worshiped Satan, and go on this long thing. And earlier this morning, her mother told her again, I'm praying for you, sweetie, that you would know Jesus. And she said, the only way I'm ever going to believe any of this is if tonight someone comes up to me sent from God to say that he loves me. So she gives her life to Jesus. She starts evangelizing to the rest of the people in her group. And I gave her my number to keep up. I I kept up with her over the next year as she would uh, share devotionals with me and talk about how how she was growing more in love with the Lord. And this just, this has been one of the most radical things I've ever experienced. So what happens when the kingdom of God is coming near is it draws people to the King. 